Good day, chaps. So this is part two of the future main battle tank project. And the tanks today will be the MLC-50 conventional designs. They were for similar nature to the previous vehicles we discussed, but differed in being overall lighter, but having to make unacceptable sacrifices to achieve this. So in our previous introduction video, we discussed the agreements made between the UK and Germany for the design of a joint project to build a tank usable by both nations. But we didn't go into much detail as to why they would want to have a joint project or any benefits of this. The primary purpose of such designs are often one of commonality and cost. The cost bit is fairly easy to understand. By pooling your resources and budget together, you can, theoretically, split the R&D and development costs in half. And as this is usually the most expensive part, with a much lower budget than the actual procurement, it makes sense. Providing you are both after the same end product, you can double your resources and, due to the final outcome being acquired by both countries, you can lower the overall production costs. The second part is commonality. This too is fairly simple, in theory. The idea being you have a product that has interchangeable characteristics that can be easily swapped, replaced, maintained and operated and saves time with the training of crews or staff, as familiarity with one is transferable to the other. This in theory reduces procurement costs, training and logistic strain. But there are factors to take into consideration. It can hamper creativity and forces compromises that might not be wanted, particularly if approached from a joint national project where the two parties have widely different views about what is considered good or bad in a subject. One group might believe that something is the best thing growing, the other that it's truly abhorrent, and yet both need to make compromises to make it work. This can further decrease a vehicle's overall operational capacity. Often designing a system that is able to adequately fulfill a wide variety of roles while suffering at not being able to excel at the one it should be or is intended for. A jack of all trades and master of none, if you will. While the costs of the project will rise if multiple expensive components are used to meet both parties' expectations. Another problem is divergence. This comes about as a series or sequence of vehicles are designed that break away from the original common goal. This can start off as a pebble in the ocean, but can and does often cause huge problems later on. This is often caused by the addition of a new element from one party into the sequential plans without forming the other partner, which will have a knock-on effect, increasing schedules and causing delays, which in R&D terms can rack up much heavier costs than were ever anticipated for. If these delays and costs stretch to the level they begin to get political attention and reprimands, the whole project could be scrapped at a net loss of both sides. The term commonality can be broken down into several subdivisions, and these are broadly defined as the following. There's the hybrid one. This method often combines several capabilities or roles, often fulfilled by different vehicles into one system. While it can have some uses, it normally produces a machine that's okay at a few tasks, but not good enough for one dedicated role. Then there's the modular one. This allows multiple modules to be switched from one hull to another to change its role, but still based on one chassis. A base platform, for example, can be easily modified to be an ambulance or an APC or a signals vehicle. This can be good, but needs strict control to prevent divergence, which can result in new modules not working or being shareable between nations. And the hull itself needs to be powerful enough for the top end module, but might be totally excessive for the lower end modules and thus a waste of resources. And then there's the family one. This uses a hull of a platform for multiple vehicles and roles. In the case of future main battle tank, the tank is the basic vehicle. However, that hull should be easily usable for a bridge layer, an armoured recovery vehicle, or a self propelled gun piece, each using the same basic starting platform. This can be problematic if the starting platform has dimensions that make it unsuitable for later adaptions. So now we have the basics of commonality. How did it begin to affect the future main battle tank? This came down to those earlier meetings, 
when certain aspects were not examined thoroughly or discussed and agreed upon, with vital differences that stem from each nation's general staff targets and military load classifications. The Germans set their maximum target at MLC 50 for future main battle tank. This was based on several factors, but most importantly it was down to the bridge layers they used. The Germans used the Leopard bridge layer which was rated at class 50. The UK, who preferred heavier tanks at this time, had class 60 bridge layers. This led to a problem, and one that should have been resolved much earlier to be honest. The German team felt that any future main battle tank which could be used by them would need to be under 50 tonnes and favour mobility and firepower with armour as a secondary consideration. And to be fair they were not aware of the new British armour before they'd met. Meanwhile the British were all out for a conventional tank with a balance of features and this had to be turreted yet shaving off 10 tonnes of weight would render their own protection layouts incompatible with their own general staff targets. The tank they envisioned simply could not work at less than 50 tonnes and still offer a significant improvement over Chieftain. This conflict over weight class caused the first split in their partnership. The British had, admittedly, agreed on the premises that they believed the Germans would be buying whatever we designed anyway. The very notion that Jerry might actually have thought the other way round was completely alien to them. It was said later by those involved that we approached this whole subject with a it's our way or the highway attitude, but Germany just wasn't going to play this game. And so while the idea was never going to gain traction, luckily the British already had several vehicles drawn up from a previous study that met this weight criteria. The first of these was the class MLC-50 Concept 1. This was similar in appearance to the larger MLC-61, however it lacked any Chobham armour on the turret, noticeable by the lack of an angled front, and no Chobham on the hull sides, with the only plate being the front hull. Thus the turret could only resist 105mm APDS rounds. The main gun was still a 110mm gun with 40 rounds and the vehicle had a four-man crew with the commander, gunner and loader in the turret and the driver offset in the hull. The commander had a night sight but nothing else. Power was provided by a CV-10 TCA engine rated at 938 brake horsepower to save weight. The overall length was also marginally shorter at 7.3 metres, with one less road wheel and hydrogas suspension. Although in the pros and cons the vehicle was still noted to have a good rate of fire and mobility, she was marked down for inadequate protection. The second vehicle was drawn to a radical, for the UK, approach to try and resolve the situation. For this they shortened the hull and decided to keep the Chobham armour. To get around the weight issue, they placed the driver in the turret, who would also double up as the gunner. This cleared up a lot of frontal volume, which instead could be used for ammunition stowage, and the vehicle had a distinct pike nose look to it. The protection was actually slightly better than the other MLCs on the hull front, as the space saving allowed them to overcompensate. They didn't have to worry about a top plate or driver's access. Power was to be provided by a CV-12 engine. Overall, this vehicle was drawn up more as a gesture to the Germans, as in our eyes it was an automatic fail. The whole gunner-driver combination, although designed so that it could drive and fire somehow, still put far too much burden on the crew positions, and the vision devices would have simply not worked. This one was an automatic fail. The last of the Class 50 conventional tanks puts the driver back where he belongs, in the hull. However, in a reverse from the first vehicle, this one featured the armour on the turret as normal, with Chobham blocks over an aluminium skeleton, and immunity to 105 Hessian heat over the frontal arcs. However, the hull itself had no protection, just angled steel of about 3 inches or so. Power was provided by CV-12 again, and the vehicle was in a 44 tonne range. Of the three, this is not the worst vehicle, and several main battle tanks have been designed in a similar manner since this but it was highly dependent on keeping its hull out of danger, which meant that it was unsuitable for some terrain. In part one of this video we discussed that the vehicles had to make use of all terrain in the likely hot zones, and this tank could not do it, nor did it meet the general staff requirements for protection, and so was deemed a failure and dropped. Well okay guys, that's it for part two, stay tuned for part three, 
We have a lot more tanks to go over and will further explore the cracks forming between the UK and the Germans as the future main battle tank wound its course and way long. The next video will be out in a day or so and we're going to look at the German KPZ-3 and some of their turreted proposals. If you did like this, press the little what's it thing up there and if you've got any questions, let me know below. Toodlepip!